Hello and welcome back to The Crime Reel. For today's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the case of Jenna Nanetti, a young woman from Livermore in California whose life was brutally cut short. Jenna was born in Contra Costa County, California, on the 5th of March 1985. Her parents, Jim and Bobby, were unable to take care of her and her grandmother, Linda Nanetti, became Jenna's legal guardian. They lived in Livermore, located on the eastern edge of California's San Francisco Bay Area, which is generally viewed to be a safe city and a great place to live. In December 2001, Jenna, then 17, met a 20-year-old man named Michael Simons. The following year, with her grandmother's consent, Jenna was legally emancipated and married Michael. Michael was Jenna's first real love, and despite having a tough exterior, Jenna was described as someone who dreamt of meeting her prince and having lots of children, achieving the happily ever after that is often so portrayed in fairy tales. After their wedding, the couple lived with Jenna's grandmother, Linda, who gave them a 1989 blue Mustang as a wedding gift. Just a month later, their marriage was already in tatters. Michael had moved out and told Jenna that he wanted a divorce. This was something that she was completely opposed to. Immediately after, or perhaps prior to, his separation from Jenna, Michael began dating another 17-year-old, Catherine Bellflower. Michael and Catherine soon began living together and the new couple became increasingly frustrated by Jenna's refusal to accept that her marriage to Michael was over. On the 6th of October 2002, Michael invited Jenna to Catherine's house so that they could discuss their future. Dressed in black trousers and a red shirt, Jenna left home, telling Linda that she was going to see Michael and would then be going to visit friends who lived in Concord. Late that evening, she called her father Jim and got his answering machine, leaving a message saying, Dad, give me a call. Dad... Call me now. I got hit upside the head with a baseball bat. I need your help now. She was never heard from again. The following day, Jenna was reported missing. Her Mustang was found burnt out in the car park of the Mountain House Bar on Grant Line Road in Tracy. But there was no trace of Jenna. It was established that the car had been there since around 11.30pm the previous evening, whereupon it had been set on fire. Fearing the worst, a search was soon underway, but after several days of inquiries, aerial and ground searches, the authorities and Jenna's family were still no closer to finding out what had happened to her. It would be almost two weeks before there was a break in the case, but it was the discovery that everyone had been dreading. On October the 19th, some fishermen found a badly decomposed body just outside of Holt, about 35 miles from Livermore, where Jenna had been living. The clothing matched that which Jenna had been last seen wearing, but due to the level of decomposition and the fact that animals had attacked the body, further tests were needed in order to identify the remains and the cause of death. Soon after, it was confirmed that the body belonged to 17-year-old Jenna, who had been killed by two shots to the chest. As the missing persons case became a murder investigation, Michael was investigated, but was ruled out of the inquiry. Progress was slow. Two months after Jenna's body was found, the Carol Sund Carrington Memorial Reward Foundation in Modesto announced a $5,000 reward for information, leading to the arrest and conviction of those responsible for Jenna's murder. The investigation stalled. It would take another two months before an extremely fortunate chance encounter led to a break in the case. On the 28th of February 2003, East Bay Regional Park District Police Officer Tim Phillips was out on his routine patrol. As he was heading through a remote area near Del Valle Road in Livermore, he came across a shocking scene. A man and a woman wearing blue surgical gloves were at the side of a road next to a car. The man had looped a rope around the neck of the teenage girl and was attempting to strangle her. 
As the girl began losing consciousness, the police officer intervened, saving her life and arresting the two people responsible. The woman was Catherine Bellflower. That was the woman who Michael left Jenna for, and the man was Catherine's friend, Geoffrey Hamilton. The girl who they were trying to kill, Michael Simon's new girlfriend, 16-year-old Aspen Lum. As Catherine and Geoffrey faced the police interviews, the tangled story of how the murder of Jenna and the attempted murder of Aspen were linked and it finally began to unravel. We know that Michael left Jenna the previous summer and soon began a relationship with Catherine. Michael and Catherine soon tired of Jenna's attempts to save her marriage and they came up with a plan. Michael knew that Jenna had a life insurance policy for either $50,000 or $100,000. Accounts vary as to the exact amount. So they decided to kill Jenna in order to get their hands on this money with which they planned to buy a house. Michael and Catherine enlisted the help of Jeffrey Hamilton to help with their plan. Neither Michael nor Catherine owned a car, so in return for Jeffrey being their driver, they agreed to allow him to live in their house once they had collected the insurance money. Jeffrey never even met Jenna until the night that the trio killed her. On the 6th of October, Michael invited Jenna over to the house where he lived with Catherine to talk about their relationship, hinting that they may get back together. Unknown to Jenna, Catherine was lying in wait and as Jenna and Michael spoke, Catherine hit Jenna in the head with a baseball bat. Michael helped Jenna, appearing to take her side and offered to drive her home. Jenna wanted to go to the hospital and called her father, leaving that heartbreaking message that he would not hear until after her death. However, instead of taking Jenna either to her home or the hospital, Michael drove to a remote area where he had arranged to meet Catherine and Geoffrey. They had in their possession a shotgun, which Catherine had stolen from a neighbour several months before. Catherine and Geoffrey claimed that Michael then shot his estranged wife multiple times, although Michael would later claim that it was Geoffrey who had pulled the trigger. The trio then dragged Jenna's body under some nearby bushes and fled the area. With the body hidden, Michael then drove the Mustang to the mountain house bar, where he set it on fire in order to burn any evidence. Jeffrey and Catherine followed him there and, after disposing of the gun, they returned home. According to Catherine, her and Michael would later retrieve the gun, weigh it down with rocks and dump it somewhere in Oakland in the water. Catherine and Michael got engaged shortly after the murder but broke up just a few months later on Valentine's Day 2003, by which time Catherine was pregnant with Michael's child. By this point, Michael had tired of Catherine and had started dating a 16-year-old girl by the name of Aspen Lum. Upon finding this out, Catherine asked Geoffrey for his help with disposing of her love rival for a second time. The pair convinced Aspen to get in the car with them and drove towards a remote area of Mendenhall Road, just off Del Valle Road, where they were caught red-handed by police officer Tim Phillips. Following their police interviews, Catherine, Jeffrey and Michael were charged with Jenna's murder. The prosecution put forward the theory that the three of them had plotted the murder under the false assumption that they could collect the money from Jenna's life insurance policy, not realising that the sole beneficiary was Jenna's grandmother, Linda Nanetti. Additionally, Catherine and Geoffrey were charged with the attempted murder of Aspen. Catherine pleaded not guilty in 2003 and in August that year she gave birth to her and Michael's baby, a girl who was put up for adoption. By 2005, Catherine had changed her plea to not guilty by reason of insanity. Then in May 2005, Catherine changed her plea once again and admitted that she was guilty of murder with the special circumstances of lying in wait and killing for financial gain. In July that year, she was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison and remains in Central California Women's Facility. 
Jeffrey pleaded guilty to charges of second degree murder and was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison in exchange for his testimony against Michael, who continued to protest his innocence. Michael's trial began in October 2005. Approximately 20 witnesses were called, including Daniel Bonacic. He was a friend of Jenna's who testified that a month or so before Jenna was reported missing, he witnessed an argument between her and Michael outside Granada Bowl in Livermore. During this heated argument, Daniel heard Michael tell Jenna that he was going to kill her. Michael admitted that he had been present at the time of Jenna's murder and was responsible for torching the car, but continued to deny that he had been the trigger man stating that it was Jeffrey who had fired the fatal shots. However, Jeffrey insisted that it was Michael who shot Jenna. Jeffrey's version of events were backed up by Catherine's earlier police statement, in which she also identified Michael as the killer. Michael's defence team did not call any witnesses nor present any evidence, instead arguing that the prosecution had no solid evidence that it was Michael who had gunned down his estranged wife claiming that the prosecution were far too reliant on the testimony of Jeffrey Hamilton. Michael showed no emotion throughout the trial, even when a picture of Jenna's decomposing remains was shown in court. The jury rejected the theory that Michael had murdered Jenna for financial gain, but nonetheless found him guilty of first-degree murder. As the San Joaquin County District Attorney's Office had opted not to pursue the death penalty, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. By the way, this story featured in Season 8 of the Deadly Women series. That concludes today's story. Please subscribe to the channel, click like and comment down below. Thank you for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst, did you know Livermore has the world's longest lasting light bulb? It has been on since 1901 at one of the fire department premises. Goodbye.